Hello, everyone, and welcome to I Didn't Sign Up For This, the show where we show you what our show is about. So here we go. (laughs) Carrie, let's show them what we're talking about. What have we got? Well, Tim, have you ever seen the movie Serendipity? Serendipity. Remind me. John Cusack, Kate Beckinsale, they meet at this it's around christmas time and they meet and they're shopping and they both decide they're gonna buy their significant other a pair of gloves and they pick up the same pair of gloves and they both end up with one and then that spins into this whole romantic comedy where she i have seen this film okay she writes her number in a book and she says you know if we're meant to be together then you're gonna find this book so tomorrow i'm gonna write my number in a book and i'm gonna go take it and sell it to a used bookstore or donate it to a used bookstore and if you find it then we're meant to be right (laughs) so fast forward years later and they can't quit thinking about each other yada 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 And now I would love to live in a romantic comedy where everything just falls into place and there's synchronicity and it's, it's this beautiful romantic story or this beautiful, amazing job that's laid out before you and, and all of these things happen. But what I really want to talk about tonight is, is destiny versus creating your own life because I'm so big on creating your own life and being able to design your life in a way that it fits your needs and it makes you happy because happiness in my opinion is everybody's ultimate goal if it isn't you know maybe you should think about it because most everything that we have in our lives that relate to a goal has to do with an ultimate outcome of happiness we're not going to set goals to be miserable or unhappy and if if we are, they should probably give me a call. They need a life coach. Um, but yeah. I can't help but wonder, and I'm sure that I'll share stories throughout this podcast tonight that will help the listeners understand why I'm thinking about this and why I'm kind of dwelling on it. But if we have freedom of choice, which we do, we can choose to succeed. We can choose to set goals. We can choose to change our goals. How much of that is really tied into synchronicity and destiny? Or does synchronicity and destiny even exist? Well, that's that's a really interesting question. I am drawn back to a comment that I made in a podcast here not long ago where I talked about how if hard work and ambition were enough, every woman over the age of 13 on the plains of Ghana would be a multimillionaire. Right. But the fact of the matter is you're a woman on the plains of Ghana. And you're not likely to be a millionaire at all. You're likely to have a short, difficult life carrying giant jugs of water on your head, right? Just by virtue of the fact that that's what the universe dealt into your hand that you are now playing. And so I don't know. I think the the notion of fate or destiny is, in fact, a very comfortable concept if we look at it reactively. Meaning, I am where I am, and everything happens for a reason, and, you know, the universe or God Almighty or whatever has a purpose for me to be in the place that I'm in, sad, alone, miserable, hungry, (laughs) clutching a bottle of rot gut or whatever, right? But God makes no mistake, so obviously I'm meant to be here living under this underpass, Right. And so that notion is very comfortable for someone who is living their life in reaction. Now, to the person who is out there, as you put it, making their destiny, carving out their life, forging ahead, trying to accomplish the things that they want in life, it's also a comfortable concept, but in a different way. Because now you say to yourself, I am destined to be the famous rapper, <laughs> right? I am. <laughs> I, I picked the one that I'm probably not destined for. I am. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, if I, the, probably. The, <laughs> Sorry. Screw you. <laughs> I could rap. <laughs> okay. Well. I could rap if I wanted to. All right. No. Okay. Never mind. Anyway, I. The first thing that occurred to me was, you know, if I if I am destined to be president of the United States. But that sounded so egotistical and so self-serving that I just, like, couldn't say it. I'm like, 
Good grief, I wouldn't want that job even if you begged me to take it. Nobody in their right mind would ever beg me to take it. But the way it was coming out of my mouth, it sounded like, oh God, this guy's kind of full of himself. He's destined to be president. And so I replaced it with the next thing that occurred to me, which was a famous rapper. (laughs) (laughs) Because you know how those two things basically go hand in hand. I mean, anything can happen these days, let's be honest. Honestly, I thought there was hopes to have a rapper in the White House when Barack Obama got there, but now we're back to just, you know, chubby white guys, so oh well. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I I mean, I've always been a hopeless romantic. I'm pretty sure I was born that way. And I always romanticized finding the one. Mm -hmm. And you know know what I mean? Like, finding that one person, your missing piece, your, your, your incomplete you know without them kind of thing and all of a sudden you just have this amazing epiphany where you're like oh my gosh you're the one you and, had you know, me at hello <laughs> <laughs> most of them have me at goodbye but that's a different story <laughs> yeah they, I, uh, most of them have me at, yes i guess i could give you my number excellent <laughs> I'm in. You're the one. Right? You're the one. You're the one. Oh, my gosh. So on the flip side, I have this pretty strong personality. And I believe that there there was a... So outside of romance and outside of finding the one, my whole belief system was I have the right to choose. And I have the right to stand up for myself and make my choices and make my decisions. And nothing's going to stop me. Right. Oh, but I'm going to find the one. Right. And there's a conflict there because... You either you either have destiny or you have choice um, minus destiny. I would venture to say because destiny is is absolute. It's the, I mean even the definition of it. It's the hidden power believed to control what will happen in the future. That's the des- that's the definition of destiny. Wow. And so basically, destiny means well. You're all on a set course. You are on autopilot. You can screw up as much as you want to or try to veer off of your path. But ultimately, you're going to end up where you're supposed to end up. I disagree with that. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. But what I'm hearing, I don't know. I think it might. there might be a little bit of a semantical difference here because what I understand as destiny, and I guess, you know, the definition is the definition. So I will, in fact, acquiesce to the definition. But my connotation of the word destiny is just the underlying notion or prevailing belief that there is some place that you wind up, some thing that you accomplish or or whatever that is inherently unavoidable and thus to be happy, you must embrace it versus fate, on the other hand, which doesn't have to be right a good or powerful thing. It doesn't have to be hopeful. It's just that's your fate, which I see as, which I don't have any faith in at all, right? I have nothing to do really with fate. I don't believe in fate. I think we, you know, go out and we make our own fate. But destiny, I think, whether it's real or not, is incredibly helpful in the sense that people become incredibly emboldened when they feel like, whatever it is, fill in the blank, is my inherent destiny. Okay. Do you know what I mean? It's it's, it's like saying I'm destined to win an Olympic medal, right? Or I'm destined to play Major League Baseball. And so because I embrace that destiny, every decision I make from running in the mornings to, you know, lifting weights and doing my wind sprints to work toward my goal because... It's my destiny. And I am encouraged and emboldened by adopting the notion that this is my destiny. And so every decision I make is through the glasses of that destiny. That's how I see the world. And that, I think, can be a very positive thing. But like I said before, if it's all about this is my fate, then that's kind of a negative thing. It's no matter what I do, I'm going to end up under that overpass. Well, and, and that's the thing, because I believe that you always have a choice. Well, let me ask you this. Let's say that when you were a kid, you re- you had this realization that you were destined to be a famous baseball player. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
and you went through all of the things that it took, the teams, the practice, the workouts, the regimen, everything, and you made it. Is that destiny or is that taking action on a desire? It is to the critical thinker taking action on a desire. But during the course of that process, it is a very helpful tool to believe. Whether it's true or not is not nearly as relevant as much as you placing faith in your quote unquote destiny. Like if if I decide that, hey, this is it and this is my destiny and I'm absolutely sure. And maybe I've had a little, I don't know, spiritual experience or certainly something that I've interpreted as a spiritual experience a couple of times. And so my underlying prevailing ultimate destiny is reinforced a couple of times. And then I back up and say to myself, hey, I, there's no way that could ever have happened if it wasn't, in fact, my destiny. And so that next morning, when it, the alarm goes off at 545 and it's time to get up and you know run that 5K in a better time than I did day before yesterday, I do it because it's my destiny. And I think it's just a mechanism. Okay. So I have a new def- definition for destiny based on that thought process. Okay. What if destiny is desire plus faith? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so so destiny and fate are not intertwined. We've just redefined destiny. I'll call I'll call uh, Webster tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let him know. But we've been thinking about this word destiny. <laughs> Our definition is And different. so I'd like you to make a quick change, if you don't mind. Jot this down. <laughs> Jot this down, Webster. What are you? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that'd go very well. But I would venture to say in the, con- the context is desire plus faith. So you have faith in the desire. Because I've had a lot of desires in my lifetime, and I can pretty much venture to say that because I didn't have faith that they would be realized – They were not my destiny. I do, however, believe that my destiny is to be a very successful life coach and to write a book, get it published, do webinars, do seminars, get out in front of people and, you know, make make a difference in the world. That is my destiny. But that is my desire plus faith equating to that destiny because it didn't come until later in life. Yeah, I can definitely go with that. I can go with that. Okay. Yeah, like I say, it's it's just it it is a not coping mechanism necessarily, but more of a a mechanism of accomplishment. I tell myself and choose to believe and embrace that this is my absolute irrefutable destiny. And through those lenses, every choice you make is defined. I only make those choices, you know, if I've got to choose between writing another chapter of the book or hitting the crack pipe. (laughs) (laughs) Only on the weekends. (laughs) Uh, You know, and then I, I, I look at the blank sheet of paper and I look back at the crack pipe, but then I say, no, it is my destiny to publish all these written works, yada, yada. And so if I work through that paradigm, then I'm going to take action that leads to creating the book. And I'm going to put the crack pipe down. <laughs> right? I don't mean like, right. okay, so I just feel like I should say there are tons of people who have drug addiction issues and I'm not making fun of you. I'm just <laughs> I'm just trying to come up with, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing metaphors on the fly here. Cut me some slack, right? Well, I don't think they're listening to our podcast. Yeah, probably not. Probably so- not. But no, I, I get I get what you're saying, and, and so I guess there's a balance of destiny and action in, in order to succeed. Because it can be your destiny to achieve greatness, but because you get sidetracked and you get moved away from your your authentic self and your true capability and potential, you may never achieve your destiny, um, or you may, may never achieve your full potential. And how many of us actually take the time to achieve our full potential or do we get sidetracked? It may not be a crack pipe, but it might be ABC Thursdays or, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, avoiding the things that would make you great because you're comfortable with what is good or, 
you're comfortable with that return on investment with a minimal investment, you're getting a return, you're all right. And and that leads us to something else because <laughs> I am very much a put your shoulder to the wheel girl, right? And so I get in there and I work hard and I do what it takes. And a lot of times, whether it's a relationship or a potential job or or whatever that is for me in my past, I have put my shoulder to the wheel and I'm sweating up a storm and I'm making this happen. And guess what? There is no return on investment. And, you know, one, two, six months, a year into it, I'm like, huh, well, what did I do that for? I mean, I just had that recently with a, a situation with somebody where, and I will tell you that this is what kind of spawned this whole talk track tonight because I had an epiphany this week where, I am maximizing a level of effort with someone that I could potentially care about, but I'm not getting a return on investment. So I am spinning those wheels and I'm trying to make something happen and it's going nowhere. And I realized, I realized all of a sudden this week that that's what I had been doing for months now. And if I was coaching someone who was in that situation, or let's even turn it into a work situation And I'm working towards a goal in my career, but all of a sudden a year into it or, you know, nine months into it, six months into it, whatever, whatever your time limit is, all of a sudden you realize that you have been sweating up a storm, spinning those wheels and getting nowhere. Uh, Is it time to let it go? Is it time to chalk it up to this is my choice and it has nothing to do with destiny? Because in those situations you're putting in a maximum level of effort with no return on investment. And anybody in a financial world or any other professional career out there would say, if you're not getting a return on investment, you do away with the project. You throw it out the window because it's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy and effort. Okay, so now let's bring that back into a personal life. What do you do? Do you believe in destiny or do you say, you know what, I'm going to brush my knees off and I'm going to keep on going? Well, I mean, the first thing I would do is I would try to determine how I came to the conclusion that this person or even this job or project was, in fact, my destiny. I would evaluate the thought process behind that. I mean, what what makes somebody your destiny? Right. Well, and I don't necessarily know that I don't necessarily know that I've met anybody that I thought he's my destiny, even though it's been, a, you know, a desire since I was, I don't know, five, um, you know, you know, Cinderella, Snow White, you name it. We're told all these fairy tales and and we as women are brought up to believe that that's a, that's actually what happens. That's. That's the, that's how it unravels. Like all of a sudden, I mean, you know, we built upon that with, I, I, I don't even have to stop at old time fairy tales. How about eighties movies, pretty in pink breakfast club. So as any of them. And so we have this expectation of what it's supposed to look like. And it doesn't always look like that. And so, and that and that's okay. It's not supposed to, it's supposed to be real world. And I will tell you though, let me just, let me just move aside from the destiny and talk a little bit about synchronicity. When in the times in my life, when I was on the right track, there were, there were a series of events or there was some kind of indication of synchronicity. And I'll give you an example. When I, when I moved to Arizona, now mind you, the last thing that I ever thought about doing was leaving my family and moving to a different state, heading out of state. I come from a very close family. We do Sunday dinners. We do birthdays. We do all of these things together. And I was on vacation in North Carolina when I received a phone call to potentially apply for a job. So in Little did the person that called me know I was actually going through an interview process for a promotion in my current role. And so I was going through this interview process. I actually, I was sitting at my brother's house in North Carolina and had my last interview for this position 
with um, the telecommunications company that I work with that would have kept me in Utah. So I had this interview and during the course of the three weeks that we were on vacation, I went ahead, you know, had the interview, hadn't gotten anything back, but I thought, and then all of a sudden I get this phone call from this person in Arizona asking me to apply for a position that was open in our Arizona office. So I decided in that moment that if I did not get the manager position, it was an indication that it was time for me to look at potentially relocating and moving to a different state and having an adventure. And I told myself that it, if it was destined to happen, I would not get the manager position. So I got a call two days after I put that out there from the woman that was hiring. And she said, you know, I just want you to know it came down to you and one other person. And she said, we've decided to go with the other person. And she told me why. And I was like, okay. And I wasn't, I wasn't even upset about it because I knew in my heart that if I was, if I didn't get that position, cause I rocked that interview. I came out of the blue on that interview to the point that it, she even told me it was a difficult decision for her to make between me and this other person who had actually been in the role for months. So I said, well, there's my answer. And so before I left North Carolina, I went in and applied for the position in Arizona. And I reached out to the person that had reached out to me and said, hey, just so you're aware, I applied for the position. Talk to you soon. So I went through the interview process made the decision to go, I'm talking about the, in July, made the decision to apply. And by October, I was in Arizona. And everything fell into place from selling my camper to selling my house. I sold my house within a matter of 10 days. I sold my camper for what I purchased it for in a matter of 48 hours. I was packed up and ready to go before the relocation package hit my bank account. And for me, because of the synchronicity, I said, this is what I meant to do. This is where I will progress with the company. So let's go ahead and fast forward. I moved to Arizona. Everything falls into place. Find a house to rent. I rented from a friend of mine. I had that set up. I had temporary housing while I was waiting for that to happen. Everything fell into place. Everything. There was not one thing that I had to worry about because of how smoothly it went. So you fast forward a few months later, I'm in the role. I'm moving in the right direction. All of a sudden, the opportunity to study life coaching and to obtain my certification becomes very clear to me. It turns out that there is a school that teaches this in Arizona, there, there are so many, like, it, I knew that part of the reason I moved to Arizona was to pursue this opportunity. Had I not moved to Arizona, had things not fallen into place, I never would be where I am right now. I know that about myself because Utah is not necessarily the place where you would go to find life coaching um, opportunities or or life coaching studies or anything like that. But it turns out this school was right down the street. I mean, it was it just the way everything evolved and everything fell into place. And so ultimately, because of the synchronicity and because of the series of events and how everything was easy, I moved into my destiny of being able to share something that could potentially help people and change their lives, which is far greater than moving up a corporate ladder for me. And so I have to say that faith and destiny played a role, but ultimately it was synchronicity. And so you can believe in destiny and you can believe in freedom of choice and they might intermingle and that's okay. But I will tell you the one indication that you're on the right track in life is the synchronicity that happens when you make a decision and you start moving forward. And I, and I guess from a relationship perspective and what I was dealing with recently with a situation is that there was no synchronicity. Timing was always off. You know, you can have two good people that really like each other and the, the attraction is there, but it's the wrong time. 
And that's when you have to go, you know what? I maybe in another life, maybe, maybe in a different time, it'll work, but it's not working now because I am spinning my wheels and getting, getting nothing in return. And so if I, if I turn around and take the lesson that I learned in moving to Arizona and moving through everything and project it into a relationship scenario, I know that if things don't fall into place, if you're not picking up my book with my number in it at the used bookstore, it's not the right time for us. Right. Oh, okay. I struggle with it, right? I struggle with it. Okay. Okay. So it, to be fair, I, and of course, you know, I am Captain Logic and all of that stuff as you right. pointed out. <laughs> all right. So to be fair, there is some spooky something that happens when one is committed. And it seems like people find what they look for. And once they've decided beyond a shadow of a doubt to look for that thing, they tend to find it and find it very rapidly. And it's what you're referring to as synchronicity. Things just come together. They just line up. And it's amazing that life can be this easy. But, well, okay, I'll put it in perspective with a story. I was working with a guy. This guy was, uh, he was a CEO of an organization that had raised, a very small organization that had raised a lot of money. And so a handful of people, mostly family, in-laws, brothers and in-laws, uh, were very good at getting out there, hustling, beating the bushes, and forming capital. They were really good at capital formation. And so they had this idea for a company. They went out and they formed their company. Mm -hmm. All right? And so at, at the end, by the time he ran into me, he actually had more dollars than cents. Okay. <laughs> You can spell sense however you want to. <laughs> Seriously. He kind of had more more dollars than cents, and he was li really worked up as to what the next steps were with this company and how to take this company to that next level. And the, the where we got involved was in struggles that he was having, not at work, but with his wife. Okay. Because his wife was sabotaging, very clearly sabotaging the company, very clearly getting in the way of what needed to happen for them to succeed. And, you know, I, being that objective third party, said, hey, man, are, are you married to the right girl? The entrepreneur life is not for everyone. Right. It's can be very, very challenging. It seems like it's always feast or famine. It's always super high or super low. And you have to be able to relegate your emotions to an area where they don't get impacted by those highs and lows. And if you don't do that, you really struggle to move forward with your life and in your company or relationships or whatever. Anyway, she was really struggling with this newfound love of entrepreneurship. He had taken a decent idea, a whole bunch of sales skills between him and his brothers and a couple of brothers-in-law, and they went out and just formed capital. They just pitched and raised money. And so she didn't necessarily want to be involved in all of that but felt like she didn't have a choice because they had, in fact, raised the money. And so I'm asking him, let's be honest here. Are you married to the right girl to pursue this path? Maybe this is a divergent path where the girl doesn't come with you or you don't right. go with the company. And you need to consider that as a possibility. And so then he begins telling me how they met and how against all odds... They met and found each other and were together. And he gave me this great big convoluted sort of name and number in a book that got dropped off at a bookstore type story. Okay. Right? Like your plot yeah. from Serendipity. And he gives me this whole convoluted, highly unlikely backstory of how they met. And it was fascinating. But then he made the mistake of saying... What are the chances that we would meet and come together in exactly that fashion? And I'm like, dude, you're really not going to like the math of this at all. 
the chances of you coming together and everything lining up, falling in line, and the universe bending to your will in exactly this fashion and you meeting this woman and establishing this relationship with her is 100% because that's exactly what happened, right? Right. <laughs> it's 100%. That, that's what the number is. Don't ask me the number because I will do the math for you. It's a, it's a 100%. Irrevocably, irrefutably, can't argue. It's 100%. 100%. And that, of course, you know, dampens his enthusiasm for the, the woman and the relationship a little bit. When I point out to him the logic of everything coming together exactly the way it did, is exactly the way it happened, and thus it must be 100%. That's that's the only option you have to satisfy the equation for the question that you're posing. And so I have to be wary of any type of situation wherein you're taking a given situation. So if you were to back up and say, you know, how many times will lightning strike in the yard in thunderstorms this year? And I could guess exactly somehow, right? And, yes. but I have yet to make the guess, but, but I'm just saying if I were to guess exactly compared to all the other options that would be incorrect, what are the chances that I would get it exactly? And in that particular circumstance, the odds are astronomical. But if I said it's going to strike six times this year in whatever given area, and at the end of the year, we look back and see that it did in fact strike six times. Now the odds of it happening are a hundred percent. Okay. Right. So the mistake that we make, it's called confirmation bias. We start at the end, look at what happened, compared it to all the myriad of possibilities that might have happened, and then try to do that division. We try to do the long division and figure out the chances of that happening in just that way compared to everything else. The problem is it's already happened in exactly that way. And so you can't compare it to everything else. The things that have astronomically low percentages of happening is each individual one of the everything else. As a matter of fact, at the end of the equation, all of those other things have 0% chance of happening because what happened owns the 100% chance. Uh, but there again, I have to back up and remind you of what I just said a minute ago. There's something just absolutely spooky that I cannot deny, no amount of logic or reason will allow me to deny that once we have made a committed decision and we start moving forward toward our goals or dreams or whatever it is, there is a hint of destiny that seems to step in and just speed things along. Well, I agree with that because it's all about intention. So what it boils down to is the power of intention. If I set the intention that I am going to be married to this wonderful man that I've met and we're dating and he sets the intention that he's going to marry this wonderful woman he's dating because he's dating me. Um, I'm just kidding. But if we both set that intention, mm, that's desire plus faith. Yeah. So then that equates to destiny. Right. Now, let's say that now I can, I can honestly tell you that my, in my lifetime, there have been two men that I have been involved with that I felt like on some level I was destined to be with. Well, turns out that wasn't true. But in both of those scenarios, either I made choices or these two men made choices that changed the desire plus faith. So ultimately, they change the destiny. And, you know, bless their hearts. I hope they're happy because I'm happy and I'm thankful for my evolution and where I am. And one of them, I'm very thankful that I didn't actually end up with him. Right. But um, at the time, I really believed that I was destined to spend every morning for the rest of my life with this person sitting at the breakfast table reading the newspaper. Twice. Right. And and it didn't happen either time. But because I had that desire and I put faith in that desire. And at the time, I'm sure, you know, they did too. We were moving in that direction. And then 
I don't need to get into what happened or anything like that, but there were decisions made that moved us away from that destiny. And so you have to recreate your own destiny when things happen outside of your your control because there are things that you can control and things that you can't. But if you look at our new definition of destiny, it still falls in line with the rule. It, it falls in line with, with the general look and feel of fate versus choice and free will. And... It, sometimes it's the lesson. So there are tons of articles and books out there that talk about the lessons that we have in our life and the experiences that we have. And sometimes, you know, there are people that stay with us because they're with us or they're, they're, they're just there to teach us a lesson and then they move on. Or maybe we're teaching them the lesson and then we move on. And the, so I've tried to look at every situation and every scenario my entire life. I mean, eight years old, things are happening. I skin my knee and I'm thinking, what's the lesson in this? Okay, don't ride your bike with flip flops on because when they get <laughs> wet and you slip and fall, you hurt your knee. And, and so, and maybe that's something that not everybody thinks about, but it's the experience has always been in the forefront of my mind since I was a kid. I remember the first time I was truly devastated about something and I looked in the mirror and realized that I was having an experience that I'd never had before and I was 10 years old. And so I don't think that there are bad experiences and good experiences. I think they're just experiences and it's really how you handle them and how you pull the lesson and how you pick yourself up and how you move on and how you do all of these things to get to where you want to be, to get to your destiny, which is your ultimate desire and faith and the ability that you can get there. Because just like you said, when you set that intention and you move forward or you move in that direction, you still can't control the players in the game. Right. Other than yourself. You know, like I can't, I can't fall in love with someone And expect that they're going to love me back exactly the same way. Or they're going to show up for me the way that I would show up for them. And so when they don't, I have to let go. I have to move past it. Because otherwise, I'm chasing a false destiny. And and over time, the desire goes away. Or the fate, then it goes away. and, And you move into something else. You evolve. And so I truly believe that there is something out there. There is a... A spiritual connection with the intentions that we make. And maybe that's what you're talking about. But I will tell you the minute that you deviate from the desire and the faith that you can achieve and you shift your focus somewhere else, your path will change. And so that can be used for good or bad. Well, I don't know. This pesky little thing, confirmation bias. And basically what confirmation bias does is that in a nutshell is basically the practice of deciding an outcome that you want. Okay. And then interpreting all of the evidence leading up to that outcome as supporting the outcome you've decided you want. So when that boss tells you how dissatisfied he or she is with your performance, you come back and tell yourself that the dressing down you just got was nothing but him or her grooming you for the top spot in the company. (laughs) And in, in fact, it's not. It's He's basically calling you an idiot as nicely as he possibly can without getting a lawsuit on his hands or her hands. And, you know, you choose to interpret that in a way that fits the narrative you've already decided upon. But but isn't that isn't that moving away from reality? It is moving away from reality. Absolutely. But we do it in under the guise of destiny. We do it by saying, look, I just know that this is what's supposed to happen, that this is where I wind up. We decide the end to begin with. And then instead of intently working toward the end, we interpret any work we do toward it, away from it, to the side of it. We interpret any behavior by any other people involved as feeding into the ultimate destiny, confirming our biases, regardless of reality. Reality doesn't matter at that point. And I think that there are people who will involve themselves in that confirmation bias, much to their own chagrin. you know, it's that guy who tells himself that he is absolutely destined to be a major league ball player. And so 
running and eating cleanly and working out and lifting weights would just be overkill. He doesn't want to embarrass the other guys in the major <laughs> leagues, right? Yeah. He just wants to make the team. And so he's so convinced that that is his destiny, that all the feedback that he's getting from other players, from coaches, from fans, from the scale, from the mirror, right? From his batting average or any statistics that he might be carrying is telling him, no, this is not your destiny. But he interprets each and every item as supporting that ultimate destiny because it is his irrevocable, irrefutable birthright destiny. So what happens to him? Ultimately, he becomes a very sad person. Okay. Ultimately, he comes to realize that you're not going to get there without the work. You're not going to get there without the drive and desire and effort. And he, reality will come a call it at some point. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it will. I think everybody hits their point where they go, you know what? I am barking up the wrong tree. And it's time for me to get real with myself and be honest with myself and understand that I need to course correct or I'm going to be miserable. And you don't want to live in that alternative state for very long if you're not willing to put the action into making it happen. Is it the difference? Is it potentially the difference in dreams versus a realistic goal? Because that's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like we're saying, I can be a dreamer. I can dream about living on Mars. But my realistic goal is something completely different. Because my the desires of my heart versus the crazy out there dreams, there's a difference. I can fulfill the desires of my heart because I'm willing to put in the work. I'm willing to take action and believe that I can achieve. It doesn't mean it's going to be an easy road, but then I can have very unrealistic dreams that are fun to fantasize about. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is you're not separating your wishes from your wants. And a wish is something that you simply wish existed. I remember having this conversation uh, with a friend of mine who is a dancer, and she was very frustrated because the dance company that she with that she was in school with there were a lot of these people who wished they were dancers but they don't actually want to dance and it's very easy to tell the difference because the people who want to dance dance and the people who wish they were dancers wear the clothes <laughs> yeah they take pictures on instagram Ugh. You know what I mean? They're, they they talk about it and blog and vlog and write and wish and joke and take pictures of extremely interesting stretches and yoga poses and what have you and pump it all out on Instagram. Whereas the dancers simply want to dance. If I'm not choreographing, then I'm performing what I have choreographed. It's the drive. And that's all I want to do. Yeah. That's just, that's my thing. That's what I want to do. Where many of the others simply wanted to photograph themselves and put those photographs in interesting stretches on Instagram. How do I know? Because that's what they were doing. Yeah. Ultimately, as we've talked about before, ultimately people always, always, always do what they want to do. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. They, they get engaged in whatever the behavior is they want. And so whether that's some boss or work situation or significant other or this, you know, relationship that you're talking about, if that person wanted to be with you, he would be with you. It's very easy math. Right. Well, and If he does not want to be with you, if he wishes he could be with you, he will go do what he wants to do and wish he was with you. But wishes are not wants. Well, then that's the lesson in all of this. You have to determine what you want and understand the difference in a want and a wish. And then make your destiny that ultimate desire plus faith that you can achieve it. That makes sense to me. That puts a process to it. It puts structure to it. When when the truth is, is a lot of these decisions and a lot of these things that happen to us, they're not logical. They're emotional. We feel them. We don't think them. But if you can combine the two, 
and, and make it a process, you have the potential to achieve great things. You have the potential to drive your desires and, and succeed. Think about it in terms like this. How many people do you know that would tell you that they wish that they were or perhaps even want to be a rock star? Oh, tons. Yeah. Very common thing, right? It's very easy to tell the difference between the people who wish they were a rock star and the people who want that for their lives and are on that path. Because when you have somebody who wishes they were at the top of that mountain, they wish they had fans untold and standing room only crowds and uh, standing ovations at the end of every song and begging for encores. That guy's a wisher. The wanter, he wants to be on a bus with half a dozen other sweaty, stinky guys hammering out chord progressions, practice until his fingers bleed, right? practice until he can't talk the next morning because he's got to hit that high note, right? You got to hit that high F, dude. If you don't, the song is going to just fall apart. That's what people are there for, right? Right. Give me the guy who wants that. I, I don't tell me how you wish you were a, a tournament tennis player. Tell me how you want to get back in that stinky Chevy Astro with the bed in the back <laughs> yet again with not one but two other grown men who want the same crap. And, oh, by the way, if you happen to draw out against each other once you get there, one of you is going back to the van for the weekend while the other one moves on in the tournament. And you're willing to take that risk. And you will go park, you know, behind a 7-Eleven somewhere next to the dumpsters because you don't have the money to put into a, a Motel 6. I mean, that's like, at the time, $22, $23 a night. I don't have that kind of cash. Right. Right. But I love the game so much that that's what I want to do. I will swing those barn doors open and we will sit out the back and we will eat hot dogs uncooked and we will be down at the tennis club pressed and starched in our whites. That's really dates me <laughs> the next morning, right? Right. That's when people wore collared white shirts to everything. It wasn't Wimbledon. Everything. Every, the crappy little town opens, right? Right. And you want to be engaged in the behavior because I love competing and I love thinking about it and I love playing the game and I love the other players and I just love the drama of it all and the power and the passion of it all. And once in a while, you do kind of kick back and you're out early and you, you think and fantasize and dream about how maybe one day you're the guy holding the big silver trophy on the grass courts. But by and large, that guy will never be there, right? You've got to love the behavior, the activity of, of, of just pouring it in. You've got to love to be rolling down the road on that bus if you're the musician, working on those chord progressions until you just could do them in your sleep. That's the guy who actually does something. He's not in it for the fame of the accolades or even the money. All those things are great. He's in it because he loves the music right. or he loves the game or, or whatever it is. Or loves the person that they want to be with versus sitting there wishing they were with somebody that they were never going to put in the action. It's all, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. You reel it down to the very personal level, and you're right. It is all the same thing. If somebody wants to be with you, and you want to be with that person, you will be together. And not ultimately one day, every day is another step closer, and they're obvious steps. Because the behavior you want is... Saturday morning breakfast, reading the paper together on the porch, and you want to engage in the behavior. And if you don't want to engage in the behavior, you won't. And if both of you don't want it, you won't. If he wanted that, right. it would be happening. Or it would certainly be moving toward that at a pace that you found to be absolutely astounding. Right. It would, it would be synchronous, synchronicity. 
it, it would truly be synchronicity and it's not. And, and there are cases that for people where it is and there are cases for people where it's not. And you have to be able to identify whether we're talking about the great guy sitting on my porch reading the paper with me on Saturday morning or we're talking about that career opportunity that you feel like keeps passing you by. Sometimes letting go of things that are hard that don't fall into place actually opens up an opportunity for you to embrace the things that do bring synchronicity into your life. What about the guy or the girl that has been interested in you for months now that you've been pushing back because you're paying attention to the guy or the girl that is making you work hard for nothing? I mean, what about, what about those people? And, and, and what if, what if what you truly want, like the desires of your heart could be behind that door as opposed to the one you keep beating your head against trying to understand why it's not working. Or from a business perspective, what if your dream job opens up to you when you stop trying to progress the way the, and take the path that everybody thinks you should? And, and so really it is, there is an, it's the same thing for a personal relationship and the corporate environment or your career or your life. It, it's the same thing. If you are standing in front of a door that will not open, move away from that door and go to the next one. Find a new door because if it won't open, there's a reason it won't open. And we may not have all the answers. We may not completely understand why that damn door won't open. But the longer you stand at that door, the less opportunity you're going to have at other doors. That that makes sense right. to me. That's right. I love it. Sure. Good enough. All right, then. Well, in that case, I guess we will put a bow on it and just let's say my favorite part. Dream your life. And live your dreams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's cheesy, but it's good. I like it. I love it. I love it. It's great. It's our tagline. All right. Well, in that case, we will wrap it on up and talk to you next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>